I'm Taka Sakaeda, sushi chef and owner of Naminoi Restaurants. I'll be answering your questions from Twitter. This is Sushi Support. Queen's Custodian asks, I know this seems like a stupid question, but can I just buy sushi grade fish from the market and cut it up and that's sashimi? Simple answer, yes. Sashimi is raw fish sliced for consumption. So the only questions come into mind are what is sushi grade? Generally in the American markets, sushi grade is referring to any fish that has been treated in a way to prevent bacterial growth. Generally when we are talking about sushi grade fish in Japan, oftentimes it needs to be wild fish, it needs to be line caught. There's a process called ikijime. It is a technique used to kill the fish instantly and then to remove the nerves from the spinal cord to reduce the amount of lactic acid that is released into the fish. GJ Wellington Hurst asks, interactive tweet, please reply to this with a description of your ideal sushi roll. So my ideal sushi roll actually is very simple. I like what we call hosomaki. I can show you one right now. Here I have a makisu. Makisu is the bamboo mat designed for rolling sushi. Seaweed actually has two sides shiny side and rough side. For this, we're gonna leave the rough side on the outside. I'm gonna get the appropriate amount of rice here. Basically make a little bed for my protein to sit inside. And wasabi, and I'm gonna fill with tuna. I'm gonna bring the back edge of the nori to the front where the rice meets, create one nice press, roll over to make the final seal. And basically now my tuna roll is done. And generally, uh, hosomaki is cut into six pieces. Very simple tuna inside, some nice wasabi, soy sauce, that's heaven. Uvernius asks, how much wasabi is too much? Let's start with what is wasabi? Wasabi is a rhizome. It is often growing on the sides of very freshwater streams. All you need to do to produce wasabi is take this wasabi root and grind it. What's most commonly seen in the US markets is some sort of derivative of horseradish that has been colored with food coloring and maybe there's some other seasonings added, salt or sugar. Unless you actually see a chef with the actual wasabi root, you're most likely having horseradish. And the reason why fresh wasabi isn't used in all restaurants it is it is very expensive. If you're using enough to overpower the flavor of the fish and you're just using it to mask everything, I would say that's too much. Okay, CCS, how many of you have had sushi? Are there different types? Is it good? Does it taste so like chicken or salmon? Tell me, does it ever taste like chicken? No, I will say there's no sushi out there that should taste like chicken. As far as different types, I do have a platter here of different types of sushi. Here you have takamaki, my favorite roll. Next to that is called gunkan, the rice underneath that's wrapped with seaweed, topped with ikura. In front there is two pieces of akami nigiri sushi. And then here is a sashimi, two slices of akami there. And this is kind of a, not a traditional futomaki, but in the style of, there's salmon, yellowtail, tuna, and some cucumbers in there. And a salmon roll with tobiko called uramaki, where the rice is on the outside. And this also is another way that we can incorporate more ingredients into a roll so that we can have you know, more creativity or, or different types of things inside of a roll. Honey504 asks, for sushi eaters, what is eel sauce? My son said blood and all of a sudden I'm not well. <laughs> okay, I, I think that your son needs to show you some respect and stop lying to you. <laughs> eel sauce is not blood. Real eel sauce is made from roasting the bones from the eel, creating a stock, basically eel stock, and adding that with soy sauce, sometimes meat in, uh, some type of sugar, steeping that in the bones to create uh, eel sauce. Sushi Pop US asks, what's the strangest ingredient you've had in a sushi roll? For me, it's not personally strange, but maybe people might uh, find it to be strange. There's a fish called fugu, the uh, puffer fish. And uh, in the wild, they eat certain shellfish and it creates a poison in their body. And this is one of the most poisonous fish in the ocean. If you take that same fish and farm raise it, not allow that fish to have certain shellfish, there's no poison created in the fish. So now you're able to eat the entire fish. From one of these farm raised fugu, one of the best parts is actually the liver. Fugu liver in a roll with shiso leaf and some ume paste is one of my favorite rolls. Abandons asks, why is sushi so expensive? It's five grains of rice and like a gram of fish, WTF. Fish tends to be expensive, especially high grade, very fresh fish. Grading is dependent on uh, obvious taste, texture, fat content, but also color grading from yellowfin, $18 a pound up to $70 a pound on depending on different cuts of that fish. The most prized fish are generally line caught that causes the least amount of damage to the fish. The boat has a refrigeration that might increase the cost to the fishermen. And on top of that, there's a lot of waste that goes into the fish. A lot of the fish is not 
edible for sushi. Kaleti Susan asks, why do sushi chefs wear bandanas when making sushi? I never thought of that as a tough workout. Being a sushi chef is tough work. I think that what you see as a guest is literally 10% of what the work a sushi chef does. 90% is the prep and there are large fish, like including bluefin. Sometimes whole fish can be 800 pounds. So if you're carrying a quarter of it, you need several people to carry that around, running around all day long. This is generally a job that's you know 12 hours on their feet minimum. 96DYN asks, when did sushi start having avocados in it? Can avocados even be grown in Japan? Sushi, avocados, I think it was an American advent. This was sometime in the 80s or early 90s when the California became popular. The abbreviation for California being CA is a crab and avocado. This is, I think that's the original reason why the name California roll came to be. Does it grow in Japan? I haven't seen many avocado trees in Japan. Maybe there's someone growing an avocado tree somewhere in Japan, but this is not common uh, food uh, for Japanese people. Rahit Yukam asks, in Japan, it takes up to 20 years of school to become a sushi chef, which is years longer than it takes to become a doctor. Is this true? I think that three to five years, you should have a pretty good understanding if you're really dedicated and really studying hard and working hard at it. There's been a lot of kind of lore surrounding sushi chefs. And to be honest, I think the most simple answer is that if you're a sushi chef and you want to call yourself that, you're always studying, you're always learning. So 20 years is really a short time to become a sushi chef. Shabway3 asks, I forgot to get chopsticks for my sushi, so what am I supposed to do now? Eat it with a fork like some kind of a lunatic? <laughs> I don't think that you're a lunatic if you decide to use a fork to eat your sushi, but there's also an alternate option. Sushi is finger food, so if you'd like, you can just use your hands, pick it up, and enjoy. Flip Caboose asks, what kind of fish do I use for fresh sushi rolls? There are many different types of fish for sushi, but if we're talking about sushi at home in the US markets, I do have some fish here today that you could find in the markets. Tuna here, salmon, and yellowtail. Tuna specifically, we are looking for a bright red color. Nothing should look sad, it should be bright. This is called a saku. And these are basically taken from a, the entire fish, cut into these kind of rectangle shapes in preparation for cutting for sushi or sashimi. In order to create a tender cut, I'm gonna cut against the grain. This would be for sushi. All right, so here I have a piece of salmon and it's just a little bit easier to see the sinew lines in the salmon. Sinew is the connective tissue that is connecting the muscle fibers. Generally speaking, you can cut this in any direction and you shouldn't really feel the sinew too much. Getting Sorted asks, we have been making and eating sushi lately, but we can't get the rice right. What is your secret to perfect sushi rice? I have a bowl here, sushi rice prepared. One thing we wanna make sure is that we're starting with the right type of sushi rice. Most commonly in American markets, you'll find a type of a Japanese grain called koshi hikari. It is a short grain Japanese rice, and that is most commonly used in sushi preparation. After that is really about washing process, is about releasing the starch. You know, we want the rice to be able to stick together to form a ball, but we don't want it to be gummy and too sticky. If this is overcooked, you're gonna see that this is like a big mosh, and it's gonna look uh, very, very moist moist and wet, and you'll see that the grains aren't individually distinct. And then on the other side, if this is undercooked, it'll look too distinct and it'll kind of flutter and fall apart versus, I don't know if you can see, there's a little bit of a stretch and they're kind of you know dragging each other along. Understanding that, reading that, to really focus in on and getting those fine details takes a long time to understand. Hot toddy 24 asks, it was only right to get sushi on my last night in Cali because how fresh can it really be in Utah? Will you have fresh sushi in Utah versus California? Maybe it might be a day a day different, but also uh, modern sushi chefs are now are using uh, aging process. You might be thinking that it's fresh fish, but sometimes chefs are now aging toro, for instance, for up to two weeks and allowing kind of a natural fermentation to occur, obviously in safe environment and controlling bacterial growth. The idea there is to reduce the moisture content and increase the flavor and the tenderness by going uh, through an aging process. Richard Chu asks, soy sauce question. Do you think putting soy sauce on everything, especially white rice, is faux pas? Personally, it makes me cringe when I see people put soy sauce on rice or dipping their sushi in gallons of soy sauce, but that's just me. Simply put, answer is yes, it is faux pas to put soy sauce on everything. If you are going to a high-end sushi omakase restaurant, omakase means, uh, literally translates to chef's choice. And so generally this is a type of restaurant where you don't make any decisions except for maybe what you're going to drink. Uh, generally the chef is going to 
you know, basically manicure everything to the way chef wants it. So that would include the amount of soy sauce or seasoning that's put on every fish. If you are in a more kind of quote unquote casual sushi restaurant, you do have the option to have your own soy sauce and it won't come seasoned. But generally the idea here is if you put soy sauce all over the rice, the rice will fall apart and you won't have a, you know, a beautiful piece anymore. It'll, be, it'll decompose uh, just from being wet. Amelie Over asks, today while eating sushi, I told my boyfriend he's meant to eat the ginger between the different pieces and not on top of the sushi. And he snapped back, this is how they did it in Japan. And I've been thinking of it ever since. Have I been taught wrong? I think that uh, Amelie Over, you've been taught correctly. Sushi ginger is meant to be a palate cleanser between bites of sushi. There are certain pieces that work really well with sushi, uh, sushi ginger. And uh, I think that there's nothing wrong with it. But again, setting is important. If you're in a restaurant where the chef is serving you exactly how the chef wants it to be eaten, it would be very disrespectful to put that piece of ginger on top of that fish and enjoying it together. Cody Twist One asks, what is imitation crab even made of? Sushi is ruined. Imitation crab most often is made out of pollock that's been turned into a paste mixed with some sort of starch and some seasonings. Sometimes they use artificial crab flavor or maybe real crab juice. This is actually a Japanese fish product called surimi. In Japan, surimi products are not marketed as imitation crab. Vivu Irosa asks, what is temaki? So temaki directly translates to hand roll. I think most commonly is the cone shape to where you'll see kind of the ingredients sticking out of the top. And the idea here is to turn this corner into the side here and wrap. The nori stays crisp because it's so quick and easy to make. But also this style has become very popular at to do at home. So generally if people are coming together and having a party at home, everyone is making temakis at home. Gaz Deves asks, question for sushi lovers. Am I supposed to eat this leaf? And if so, how do I do it using chopsticks? This is a, a called uh, shiso or uh, also known as oba. And yes, it is edible. It kind of has a minty herbaceous flavor and I love to have it just uh, wrapped around a piece of sashimi. It adds a great different uh, dynamic to the flavor of the dish. Nicole Conahan asks, how do sushi chefs cut sushi rolls so perfectly neat? I don't get it. So it takes a lot of time, dedication, and practice. Most commonly in the beginning, when you first start learning how to cut, we go from center and cut it in half cut this in half again. And then on each side, we cut these in half. It's obviously much easier to see something bisected, something that's half, than to see and understand what one piece is. But as we advance, faster way is to cut this in half. And instead of cutting it in half again, just going from left to right straight, but this takes practice so that we understand each piece and how big it should be. And so generally, uh, Japanese sushi knives called yanagi, designed to be a little bit thinner behind the blade and has the bevel, which is much more elongated to kind of create a thinner blade and easier to slide through. Ryan D. Jacobs asks, what kind of vinegar do you add to rice for making sushi? Sushi vinegar can either be made with rice vinegar or red vinegar called akazu. This is a vinegar produced from the lees of sake. This is kind of the residual uh, byproduct of making sake and then, you know, age to create a vinegar. And through the aging process, it kind of turns to this kind of red color. And you'll often see uh, now in higher end sushi restaurants, the resurgence of akazu. And actually akazu now is more expensive than the rice vinegar. And the smell is very, very strong. And so this is actually associated with a kind of story of the apprentice waving you know, the sushi rice as the master is mixing the rice with the vinegar. There's a lore that says that actually that akazu is so cheap and the smell was so pungent that the apprentice was there not to wave off and cool down the rice, but just to blow away the smell and the scent from the, from the master. Susie Tobias asks, what are these teeny wee orange bubble things on the outside of my sushi? I like them. Fun to pop. I think that uh, Suzy Tobias is referring to Tobiko. Tobiko is the roe from Flying Fish. This is, uh, you know, manufactured and this is created. There's flavorings in here. There's some food coloring in here as well. And, you know, one of the great things about this, I think, is that it has MSG in there as well. And so it actually uh, adds as a great flavor booster to anything that you add it to. From DKD22, who invented sushi? Ha 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 ha, it's so good. So sushi that we know today, Edomai Zushi, is credited to a gentleman named Hanahao Yohe. This was uh, around 1820, I would say. The original sushi was almost like fast food. This was originally done through basically street vendors. These were carts that carried around the rice 
and the fish and served on street sides. So people would come by, eat a couple pieces and be on their day. Sushi underscore ebooks asks, what is your favorite slice of fish? I'm gonna assume and interpret that this question means what's my favorite piece of sushi. So I have here uh, sea urchin. This is my favorite. This is actually the gonads from uh, sea urchin. The sea urchin is kind of a, a round, spherical, hard shelled uh, creature with a bunch of spikes sticking out of it. Has a very subtle sweetness, nice ocean flavor. And for some people, it's an acquired taste. Amber Lin asks, sushi question. Is a spicy tuna roll, tuna and wasabi, or tuna salad made with spicy mayo? Tuna and wasabi together, we call tekkamaki, which is just tuna roll. Spicy tuna roll is referring to tuna mixed with spicy mayonnaise and then put into a roll. Big Neasy NFT asks, when did Sushi in America become a cream cheese log slathered in mayo? <laughs> Late 80s and into the 90s, there was a little bit of hesitation for, you know, the non-Japanese consumer to have raw fish. And obviously cream cheese and mayonnaise, they do work in some types of sushi. I think it was just a great way and creative way to introduce uh, sushi to a wider audience. As long as people understand that this is not traditional, chefs have the creative freedom to do whatever they want, I think. And at the end of the day, the consumers will decide if it's good or not. Okra Wind asks, how do sushi chefs not cut off their finger or something with all the sake and beer they drink? Uh, practice makes perfect, I guess. This is a practice uh, among sushi chefs. I think that it is nice for a guest to offer a beverage to the chef. And I think that this is really designed and was originally to build rapport. And it's more of like a friendly gesture. You're out with friends and you offer somebody a drink. I don't think that a sushi chef should be there behind the sushi counter getting belligerently drunk. I don't think that's appropriate. A responsible sushi chef should know when to say no. <laughs> all right, that's all the questions. I hope you learned something. Until next time.